Stir the complacency that is there. Renew the compassion of which we are capable. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. We begin with the litany. Zacchaeus climbed a sycamore tree. He couldn't see over the people. Who else will rise above the crowd to see salvation come? Zacchaeus climbed a sycamore tree, then hurried down when Jesus called him. Who else will ignore the scorn of foes to answer a righteous Lord? Zacchaeus climbed a sycamore tree, then gave away his goods. Who else will dare to confess their sin and try to make fourfold amends? Zacchaeus climbed a sycamore tree, then spread at his house a sinner's feast. Who else will prepare a table for Christ and for every soul the town despises? Who else will look on Christ and grow? Who else will admit they're not yet grown? Who else will climb to glimpse the Lord when the road is blocked from view? Who else will open the door to the poor because, once lost, they are now found? The scripture reading. Please stand for the gospel. The reading today comes from Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. He entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not, because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. The word of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock, our strength, our Savior. Amen. I'm going to start with a really bad joke, so you can roll your eyes and groan right now just to get it over with. <laughs> Satan and Jesus were having an ongoing argument about who was better at using their computer, and they had been going at it for days. Finally, God got so mad, he said, enough with this. I'm going to have a contest that will last two hours. You can each have your own computer, and I'll judge who does the better job. So Satan and Jesus sat down at their keyboards, and they typed, they emailed, they printed photos, they scanned, they printed cards, they wrote papers, they worked on Excel. And then there was a storm, and the lightning flashed, and the rain poured down, and of course, screens blinked, and everything went dead. Satan stared at his blank screen and started to curse under his breath, and Jesus just sighed. Well, then finally the electricity came back on, and each of them restarted their own computer, and Satan was frantically searching for all the files and started to curse again and again. It's gone. I lost everything. Jesus must have cheated. And Jesus just sighed again and started printing out all of his files from the past two hours. And God just shrugged at Satan and said, Jesus saves. <laughs> you mean none of you heard that before? Come on. Yeah. Jesus saves. What does it mean to say, Jesus saves? Some of you might be a little uncomfortable with that question. And you're not the only ones because the folks in the book of Luke Acts get a little uncomfortable with the question about what does it mean to have a Jesus who saves. I think the story of Zacchaeus 
is a good place to begin to wonder about a Jesus who saves. Zacchaeus is only mentioned one time in the New Testament, and we all are told that he is short. He's a shrimp. He is so small, he has to climb a tree to see Jesus. And we're also told that Zacchaeus is a bit of a sneak. He's an unscrupulous tax man, sly enough to pocket some extra change. In fact, quite a bit of extra change. People avoid him in the sidewalk. They go to the other side of the street when they see him. So when Jesus walks up, the crowds expect fire and brimstone from Jesus' mouth aimed up into that tree. But Jesus says to Zacchaeus, Hey, buddy, I'm staying at your house tonight. Whoa. The crowd grumbles under their breath, maybe loud enough for Zacchaeus and Jesus to even hear. They can't believe that Jesus would stay in a house with a sinful man. The crowd grumbles, but Zacchaeus rejoices. How low would Jesus go, they wonder? Low enough so that our buddy Zach gives away half his possessions and repays folks four times over. Four times. We don't know about the details of the visit Jesus had with Zacchaeus. We don't know if the two of them ordered in takeout or if Mrs. Zach cooked up matzo balls from her grandmother's recipe. Maybe Zach broke out the best vintage. We don't know. What we do know, there was some rejoicing going on in that place. And they spent some time together. Have you heard of the phrase recently, he's going to rub off on you? Maybe your parents have shared that phrase before you left for Augsburg this week. Maybe they said, why don't you uh, join the choir or try out for it? Maybe some decent music will rub off on you. Or maybe they've said, why don't you go hang out in the library instead of partying three nights a week, and maybe the study hogs will rub off on you a little bit. Something like this is happening to Zacchaeus. Jesus associates with him, hangs out with him, and God rubs off on Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, hurry, come down, for today it is necessary for me to remain in your house. And later we read, today salvation has come to this house. Zacchaeus gets a new identity from hanging out with God, or rather, from God hanging out with was Zacchaeus. Contrary to our Sunday school lessons, this is not all about Zacchaeus' sin. Some of you are raising your eyebrows. Zacchaeus, small as he was, was lost in a community that falsely attributed to him the right to judge Zacchaeus a sinner. If I have to admit it, I'd rather have the Sunday school version of the Zacchaeus story than this one. This one may hit a little close to home. Now, I don't know anyone on campus named Zacchaeus, but I have a hunch there are some tree climbers among us, and I know that I have been part of the grumbling crowd again and again. If that was the end of the story, some of us would be stuck hanging off the branches, and the rest of us would have sore necks from looking up into the tree the whole time. But that's not the end of the story. Because the story of Zacchaeus reminds us that it's Jesus who saves. Jesus saves. You are sons and daughters of Sarah 
and Abraham. God chooses you whether you are the unscrupulous taxpayer climbing to the branches or the crowd of people grumbling below. God rubs off on you. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. So in the words of my son, we can rejoice. We can sing. We can shout and say, Amen! Yay, God! And all the people say, Amen! Yay, God! Amen! Yay, God! Amen. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree, the Lord he wanted to see. The Lord passed by and said, Zacchaeus, to your house today, because I'm going to your house today. The crowd was lost, all themselves were Jesus eat with them. They missed the joy that Zacchaeus exclaimed when Jesus ate with them. They yelled for all to hear. Thanks, no good for you. But Zacchaeus but Zacchaeus gave away his star. Jesus makes clear that he is the one who brings salvation home. No matter what the grumblings yes, is the son of a to us in Augie land. You are God's children. The Lord is here and this is too, cause the Lord in this place You have just made history. You have debuted Sonia Hagendorf's second and third stanzas. Of the shortest man in the Bible, although some people would argue that also Simon the Shuhite and Nehemiah would be in that category. Let us pray. Oh God, you have amazed us time and again how you touch us with your love and grace how you will never allow things of this world to separate us from your love, how you save us in so many and various ways. Today we are reminded of that love, the love that will not allow sin to divide us or evil to interrupt our lives. We know that we are more than conquerors in that love and will be guided through our days, perhaps not with answers we would expect, but with your answers that might surprise us rescue us. And this day we would ask for confidence and patience and courage and strength to live each day in your promises. We ask especially for the confidence of your presence in the lives of our Augsburg family to stay, for the Brett Holson family, the Nystrom family, as Heather mourns her father's loss and prepares for tomorrow's funeral, for the Graff family, for the Carlson family and the Davies family. And also, we ask for your healing power in the life of Mary Lowe and Connor's mother. We also celebrate birthdays and anniversaries and other people that we now lift to you silently in our hearts. For the thanksgivings and joys that give us meaning to our days, we praise your holy name. Amen. I invite you to stand, and if you know the verses to the song He Reigns, please join in. Otherwise, jump in on the chorus.
much. I just want to take a couple extra seconds to kind of emphasize how the chapel flows. We, we don't do this every time. Hopefully we won't be doing this every time, but, but just to get you into the discipline maybe and the habit of coming to chapel, you'll see Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 10, 20, Tuesday, Thursday, 11, 20. Next week on Monday, we will have favorite song and hymn chapel. So come with the things that you request and then we will know what some of your songs are so we can sing them throughout the semester as well. So be prepared for that. We'll have the various books out there. Uh, then following chapel, there's going to be a special dedication for a very important man to the Augsburg, uh, in the Augsburg community who died exactly a year ago. Uh, his name is James Carey, and there's, they're going to dedicate a plaza, so we're going to be invited to go over to the hockey arena and uh, do a dedication. I forgot one important thing. Tomorrow is 9-11 as you might know, and we will have an observance here at noon. We'll do a Tizay service led by Liz Bateman and Ray McKeever and Andy Peterson and a couple of others. So at noon, for about a half an hour, we'll be here tomorrow. So that's Monday. Tuesday, Abby Fladdenmesh, director of Campus Kitchens in a very exciting program, connected very strongly with campus ministry where we serve the community with food, will speak. Wednesday, Thelma Buckner, amazing woman, has eight children. And Thelma, uh, her kids are all either in Sounds of Blackness, Minneapolis Gospel Sound. Patty is the backup singer, or was to Luther Vandress before his stroke. Patty usually comes. Some of the kids usually come. Pass the word on campus. Bring all your friends. Get them into the habit of coming to, to chapel. If you don't get in the habit the first weeks, I'll guarantee you it's going to be hard to get into it after that. So bring, pass the word. Tell everyone to come. And then uh, Thursday... Alam Hagos, brand new to this community, speaks six languages. He's reaching out to this community. He's an exciting new neighbor of ours. And then Friday, President Bill Frame. So please come. Also, tomorrow night is our first football game. Jack, want to say anything about it? <laughs> 7 o'clock. Any, any guy that wants to sing the national anthem be on the field at a quarter to 7, and we'll, have, we'll be singing the national anthem. So let's get into the spirit of community at Augsburg in every possible way, and we ask you now to uh, receive the benediction. Like a rock, God is under our feet. Like a roof, God is over our heads. Like the horizon, God is beyond us. Like water in a pitcher, God is within us and in the pouring out of us. Like a pebble in the sea, we are in God. Let us now go out and change our world as God has changed our lives in Christ. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Monday, Wednesday, Friday is community time, which means there's food out there for you. So please take advantage of that.
Thank you, Nancy and the Riverside Singers. We're also pleased to have with us this morning the flute ensemble as well, as well as our homilist today, for um, Jan Weller, who is with the Elysian Institute. She has been um, a teacher with uh, McPhail, and has been. she told us earlier she has been working on vocation for several, several years, but didn't realize it until most recently, and now is with the Elysian Institute, actually founder of the, the Elysian Institute. Um, and I've even heard rumors about a book that's in the works as well. So we're very pleased to have her with us. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God, we listen, to your, we listen for your voice on this day. Speak to us through the words that we hear, the music that we hear, the voices and the flutes, uh, the organ, our own, our own sound of our own singing. Let us hear your still small voice in the midst of this busy world. Help us to understand ourselves, you, and vocation greater in this light. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please rise and let's sing Lord of Light on the back of your song sheets.
When people ask me about the Illusion Institute, I tell them my elevator speech, that I focus on the spirituality of work, particularly with musicians. What Parker Palmer calls our birthright giftedness, our true or authentic vocation in life. This morning, I'd like to touch briefly on two ideas related to vocation, focusing particularly on the search for authenticity in vocation, what is true and authentic to each of us. We'll look first at authentic motivation and then at authentic vocation itself. First, authentic motivation. So here you are at Augsburg. Is your career path clear to you, or are you majoring in the nationally recognized most popular major, undecided? Are you pursuing your dreams and goals, or the dreams and goals that society or other people have for you? Are you primarily following your aptitudes or your passions? Or are you lucky enough that aptitude and passion are one and the same for you? Here's a way to look at authentic motivation. Be mindful of the times you are truly and deeply engaged in an activity, when time seems to stand still or fly by. Psychologist author Mahai Chikson Mahai calls those times flow. And here's what he says about flow. Flow is a state of concentration so focused that it amounts to absolute absorption in an activity. In flow, people typically feel strong, alert, in effortless control, unselfconscious, and at the peak of their abilities. Both the sense of time and emotional problems seem to disappear, and there's an exhilarating feeling of transcendence. That sounds pretty great, huh? Artists tend to understand and experience flow consciously, but flow can happen in everyday activities, too. Just pay attention. Notice the times when you get fired up, when your heart beats a bit faster, maybe you talk a little quicker or with more energy, and when you look up, hours have disappeared. What melts your butter? What toots your horn? Why is that? Then think about where that might lead you. When you get in the habit of noticing flow, themes may start to emerge over time. If you're really diligent, you can even try keeping a flow journal. When you discover and really take ownership of these various butter melters in your own life, and there may be quite a few, hobbies and other activities, not just schoolwork, you can start to conceive how they might fit together in perhaps logical or perhaps very unique ways as you begin to imagine your future. Albert Schweitzer, the renowned humanitarian, theologian, medical doctor, musician, now there's a model for vocation, said, success is not the key to happiness. Happiness is the key to success. If you love what you're doing, you will be successful. On to authentic vocation. We're fortunate to be living in a time where the idea of vocation or calling is really emerging as a concept and philosophy that applies to all of us in every field, not just in religious life or in skilled labor. Augsburg is a leader in exploring these ideas, working to incorporate a broad vision of vocation and stimulating students and faculty to consider vocation first as personal and values-centered and as more than expertise, more than job training, more than preparing for success, however we might define it, and closely connected to serving our communities. As kids, we're often asked what we want to be when we grow up. Is it a dancer, a baseball player, a firefighter, a teacher, an engineer, a pastor, or a musician? We tend to look at outside models when we first start thinking about choosing a career. Later, as we think about college and what major to choose, we often feel pressure to select a career path long before we really understand enough about a field to know if it's a good fit. You may have a particular aptitude and interest in math, for example, and find people encouraging you to be an engineer. But what does that really mean? What do engineers really do every day? Would you find the work absorbing, intriguing, motivating, inspiring, and challenging day after day? Maybe you would, or maybe not so much. So it's important to learn much more than the expertise needed to do a job. What would happen if instead of starting the process by choosing a job or career path, we instead started by looking deeply at ourselves, examining what we're good at and what we love to do and what's important to us. Not just school subjects like math or writing or history. Are you a good listener, planner, doer, organizer, instigator, leader, problem solver? Are you detail-oriented or a big picture person? Are you persistent, diplomatic, energetic, patient, creative, and on and on? How will your faith and your values affect your career choices? How do you like to spend your time? Do you thrive on pressure and deadlines and fast-paced activities? 
Or do you prefer a laid-back atmosphere to be productive? As you learn more about your own strengths, talents, and style, apply these ideas to the careers you're considering. What is the range of options within your field? What sorts of talents, personal styles, temperament, and personalities tend to do well in each aspect of your chosen field? In other words, how can you tailor your search to fit you? In music, the talents, temperament, and personality traits of performers, teachers, composers, and music therapists, to name just four specialties here at Augsburg, vary widely. And that's just the tip of the possibilities that musicians can explore. The world is fluid, and the incredible pace of our world today requires a nimbleness previously unknown. Gaining the core knowledge, skills, and expertise in a field are just the first steps in preparing to enter the work world and creating a compelling, sustainable vocation over time. So in conclusion, you are the only one who can truly explore what is authentic for you. Your authentic vocation may or may not match what your parents or your teachers or even you yourself at this point have in mind for yourself. Parker Palmer says this process entails discovering, exploring, and owning secrets hidden in plain sight. And I love that line. Authentic vocation is no guarantee of fame and fortune, but I encourage you to be mindful, notice flow in your life, and consider authentic motivation on the fascinating lifelong journey toward your authentic vocation. Most importantly, don't squander the gift of who you are. A spiritual approach to work, authentic vocation, is not only possible, it is a path to meaning and fulfillment in life, a path to maximize your own gifts in service to your community. Let us pray. 
Wise and wondrous God, we confess that sometimes our lives are more cluttered than committed, and then we do not know which way to turn. Help us when we are lost to find you. Empower us to be more able bearers of hope, more dedicated doers of your word, more resourceful helpers of others, especially the people in our midst who are in need. Help us to be faithful accompanists to these dear ones. Lynette, Elaine, Victoria, Dale, Fritz, David, Joel, Grace Marie, Andrew, Bart, Lil, Brian, Bishop Craig Johnson. We pray for all who continue to grieve their loved ones, the Tonys, the Lairs, Lucas, Tony, Bobby, Shannon, Richard, and others who we lift before you. Lord, in your mercy. God of majesty, be with all who make music and art for your people, that through it we may glimpse you and stand in awe. And today we give special thanks for Jan Weller, the Riverside Singers, the Flute Ensemble, for Peter on the organ. Send your Holy Spirit into our lives so that we may sing your song. Help us to be in harmony with others, to create new tunes. When the sound seems faint, O Lord, we are so bold as to ask for your tending to help us find the beat over and over again. Give us ears to hear. Lead us in the rhythms of our days to rest in you. Help us to go with your flow. In your name, Jesus, leader of our dance. Amen. Jan talked about uh, vocation, and uh, I couldn't help but think as I watched Nancy and Renee lead uh, the group how, uh, how they have understood vocation. Uh, I've known Nancy for, since college days, but I, I, I'm cheap. I don't have cable TV, but I can get free TV by watching uh, uh, local channels. And Renee and Nancy both are not just talented uh, pianists and directors, but composers as well. And I, I just heard before coming in that the Masterworks Chorale is going to do one of Renee's numbers here this year. She's a, a big part of that. But she also directs a choir at Roseville Area High School, is a company nest. And Nancy is at Mayflower Church, Mayflower? Mayflower Church. And, and uh, we are just really with the best of the best here when we have you. So thanks so much. A couple of real, uh, hopefully, quick announcements. Um, you're going to stay and hear the flute uh, group here. Uh, hopefully you can do that while you're eating some cake that's provided by the uh, Lily Grant money. Tomorrow we have Danny Slack and a Friday Cheryl Looning. And not just Cheryl Looning, but it's the 50th anniversary of our accreditation, which is a big deal because accreditation is a big deal. <laughs> so uh, Frankie Shackelford's going to provide some things. And then um, we need uh, some help on Saturday. Tim Wall, I don't know if Tim's here. His dad is a pastor in Rochester, and they've got a boatload of things going to Tanzania, but they need a ton of help loading it onto a truck. So if any of you can help from in the morning hours and into the early afternoon hours, talk to me or Tim Wall, and we'll get you hooked up on that. Uh, receive the benediction. Like a rock, God is under our feet. Like a roof. God is over our heads. Like the horizon, God is beyond us. Like water in a pitcher, God is within us and in the pouring out of us. Like a pebble in the sea, we are in God. Now let us go out and change our world as God has changed our lives in Christ. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.